like to correct, there's no such thing as a diplomat sharing a few words. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to express my thanks um, to the managing director, to the dean, to the principal, to uh, all of the uh, leadership of, um, of ISBR uh, for inviting me to, uh, to take part in your festivities today. Um, it's actually an old invitation. It was something which I probably should have done uh, years ago. Years, years ago. Um, but at our age, the years go, go by very quickly, and it seems to me just yesterday that you invited me, so I feel okay. My, my conscience is clear. In January of 2012, uh, the then uh, Foreign Minister of... Uh, of India and uh, the Foreign Minister of Israel decided together on the opening of a consulate general here in Bangalore. Uh, up until then, there had been an embassy in uh, an embassy in Delhi and uh, a consulate in uh, Mumbai. But with the addition of a uh, consulate general here, uh, India joined a very, uh, very uh, elite and closed clubs a club of countries which uh, play host to more than two Israeli missions. Uh, that is to say, in France, for example, there are two missions. In Turkey, there are two missions, Brazil, so forth. Um, even the Soviet Union, uh, even uh, Russia. But there are only four countries which play host to three or more missions, and those are the United States, Canada, China, and India. So India joined this club in, uh, in 2012, and uh, I arrived here uh, almost exactly two years ago, in September 2012, to undertake this, uh, this task. Why did we, si why did we decide uh, to open up in Bangalore? The first reason was, of course, that the food in the South is better than it is in the North, and therefore it would be easier to convince diplomats to serve here. But beyond that, beyond that, um, in over the course of our relationship with India, uh, we became very aware of the fact that the Israeli, uh, I'm going to say startup and not high tech uh, because it includes other fields as well, um, but the Israeli startup field and the Indian startup field were both suffering um, from serious deficits and were suffering from deficits that the other side didn't suffer from. That is to say everything that was wrong with the Israeli startup ecosystem and everything that was wrong with the Indian startup ecosystem could be solved by something that was on the other side. That is to say, uh, the two of us were a perfect match. Um, Israel is very innovative, but we have a tiny domestic market. Uh, for those who aren't aware, Israel is a country about uh, one-tenth of the size of Karnataka. Um, it's about the size of Mizoram. And its population is the population of Bangalore such that uh, there's, no, there's no real market there. Second of all, labor costs are very, very high. Uh, when you have a, a small population and it's very difficult to get into universities to get the necessary tools that you need, then obviously uh, the services of the graduates are at a premium. And the labor is then much, more, uh, much cheaper here, but not at a lesser quality than in India. It's the same quality, but it's much cheaper. So you have here a market, you have here uh, a labor force. However, in Israel, and I say this very carefully and very diplomatically, um, the culture of innovation, the culture of development is also very, very different than that here in India. The Israeli student is encouraged to ignore his teachers. The Israeli student is encouraged to make trouble. The Israeli student, I won't say he's encouraged not to do his homework, but not doing his homework is okay. My son is a wonderful example of that. Um, whereas the Indian educational system, I believe, and I'm talking here to educators, so I, I assume I'm just talking out of my hat and I have no idea of what I'm talking about, um, is much more concentrated on precision, um, on, um, on, on, on in-depth learning, 
um, but sometimes at the expense of the, the necessary uh, intellectual freedom um, to be true innovators. Furthermore, in Israel, the culture of innovation is not just a matter of high schools and of, of academic learning as well. One thing that's very, very important um, is the Israeli compulsory military service for two reasons. One is that we have needs which can't be met by existing technologies and by existing methodologies. But we do need these technologies and methodologies in order to progress forward, in order to, um, in order to, uh, um, to properly defend our people. One of the examples from, from previous weeks is the tunnels between Gaza and Israel. We had no method of actually finding them out. So now it's a matter for the technical units to develop a methodology for that, even if it's impossible. Because there's no such thing in, as impossible in the army. Your commander says to you, this is an order. You, ha you design me, you have 18 months to design me a way to find tunnels, and you better do it. Uh, so there is this can-do attitude in Israel which comes, which comes uh, to a, a certain degree from, uh, from the military. But it also comes to a certain degree from Israeli history itself. Um, when our founding father, Theodore Herzl, was, uh, was dreaming of uh, the establishment of a state, uh, he, adopted the, he adopted the slogan saying, um, if you will it, it is no dream. And so Israel itself is a startup. Um, indeed, we received our independence uh, around the same time you did, us 1948, India 1947. But India had a continuous uh, a background, uh, which we didn't have. We had, there was a continuous Jewish presence in the land of Israel for 4,000 years. But the massive waves of immigration of uh, the first half of the, first half of the 20th century um, provided, uh, provided the opportunity to build what the dreamers said would be an ideal state. Well, it's far from an ideal state, but that idea of realizing your dreams at any cost, that idea of yes sir to your commander, all of those filter into the private sector um, at the moment that these kids, um, these kids are, are released from the army. So we have that. However, Israeli business people, especially startup people, are very, very impatient. So they make an idea, it's a great idea, they develop it a little, they do proof of concept, and then they want to sell it very fast. They don't want to develop it. They don't want to develop their markets uh, and so forth. They either want to be acquired or to sell their patents. And again, that's where the Indian side comes into this. To help convince Israeli business people that, yeah, you can do the same thing for 20 years. Earlier we were discussing this about people who had been teaching for 40 years and I've been a diplomat for almost 30 years. and. Most Israeli startup people haven't, uh, haven't been in the business more than four or five years, and they just want to get out and get rich. So that's another place here where the matchup is perfect. It's a perfect match. However, both sides have to understand that, and that's where management comes into the picture. If the Israeli comes in here thinking that he's going to sell a patent, and the Indian comes here thinking that he's going to create a relationship which lasts for 20 years or maybe forever. There's going to be a lot of misunderstanding and there's going to be a lot of uh, bad feelings at the end of the day and then not just this particular company but Israel will get a bad name in India and India will get a bad name in Israel. They say, I can't do business with these people. And as I said, that's where management comes into it. That's where young people with management skills with the ability to see the other side on one hand, but the capability of motivating their people, their workers, and their companies to show the necessary flexibility. That's what's needed on both sides. And that's why I'm here. That's why this is important enough for me to come to the end of the earth on a Sunday morning. That's where you're supposed to laugh. Um, <laughs> it's not the end of the earth, I suppose. And that's why we're here. My mission um, is, I would say, approximately 80% trade and um, tech in all forms, biotech, uh, IT, cybersecurity, um, and even other things, um, 
uh, aerospace uh, uh, aerospace cooperation, which is um, sort of a side uh, a side issue. But eighty percent of what I do is to promote these fields, um, and that's exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And out of the other twenty percent, another five or or, or ten percent is issuing visas to um, facilitate cooperation, to facilitate travel um, in both uh, directions, and to faci facilitate exchange. But we don't ignore the academic field. We have a number of academic programs going on here, um, which are very, very important, they're critically important for us. One of them is that we have a program for postdoctoral students. Um, we give away up to 100 scholarships every year for up to three years of study um, at academic uh, institutions in Israel. And not just in science and technology, uh, in, uh, in any possible field. Um, I've seen somebody, you know, um, submit a proposal for the, uh, the psychology of rats and things like that, um, but, uh, and also for, for human sciences, but definitely in management as well. Uh, so we, we provide that opportunity. We also provide an opportunity which is, it's too late for the students here, but for undergraduate study um, in engineering. It's a new program. It's a program which uh, was established uh, two years ago, uh, the first undergraduate program in the English language in Israel, since we don't use English as the language of instruction. Um, but the need for an international program and to share um, our capabilities, both um, technical and educational uh, in this field, uh, alongside the the interest um, the interest shown outside has sparked uh, has sparked this program as well. In fact, we're sending off um, a recent uh, high school graduate to to Israel this coming week. So we do see that not only the business cooperation, uh, but also in fact the the educational cooperation is a critical, a critical element uh, to promoting um, the connection between the two countries and at the end of the day, the economic connection between the two countries. Um, because I think, and I'll be a bit racist here for a second, the Jewish approach to money and the Indian approach to money is quite similar. Um, so thank you for inviting me. My congratulations once again to all of the uh, honorable recipients of uh, the awards we met upstairs. Um, I was very impressed um, as somebody who barely finished their first degree um, with the achievements uh, with the achievements of uh, of the teachers. Uh, and I hope to be uh, seeing a lot of the students here um, at the doors of uh, the consulates or submitting uh, submitting uh, requests for. Hmm? Requests for visas, but also requests for programs, requests for cooperation with Israeli, uh, with Israeli companies. Thank you.